Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today we will be moving into our second episode in literary theory, and I originally intended for this to be a single episode, part two, um, entitled Giving Good Answers, but it turns out I'm very enthusiastic about this topic, I kind of knew that going in, and the content is really long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. Um, so this is part one of Giving Good Answers. Alright, so a common truism. A lot of English teachers say things like, there's no such thing as a bad question in my classroom, or there's no such thing as a wrong answer. Um, and I actually disagree with both of those. Uh, there can be bad questions if the questions you're asking do not help you understand what you're reading. And again, for more on that, watch the first episode. Um, but for this episode, I'm actually going to focus on that second statement, the idea that there are no wrong answers to a text. Why English isn't your favorite subject? So if there are any of you out there who are voluntarily clicking on this video and English is not your favorite subject, welcome, this is the episode for you. Um, and also I'm really surprised <laughs> that, you, that you would do such a thing. Um, and actually, pause, sidebar, thank you to everyone who watches my videos. There's this part of me that looks like, oh, I really love English and obviously I enjoy what I'm doing and stuff, but then there's this part of me that's like, I have, I have no illusions about where I sit in the hierarchy of content that is the internet. Like, I don't know if you guys know this, but Netflix exists, and you're sitting here clicking on my videos, and I am so overwhelmed and so grateful that you guys are enjoying the content as well, and that you are, uh, <laughs> you're choosing to watch my stuff when you can go be watching, you know, Stranger Things 2 again. But instead, you're here listening to me ramble. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> So anyway, back to the subject at hand. Why English isn't your favorite subject? So for anyone whose favorite subject in school was not English, here's why. Likely, in the first week of your ninth grade English class, your teacher said something along the line of, there are no wrong answers. Um, and then some point during the class, in the course of that next year, you raised your hand and you said something, and the teacher kind of was like, mm, no, no. Or you turned in a paper and you were like, I got a C or something not good that I didn't want to get. And you're like, you are a bad fantasy writer. The rules of your universe are not consistent. Liar. Lies. You told me lies. And it was frustrating. It always is when those sorts of things happen. And if you ask, you know, the average student who doesn't like English why they don't like English, they'll say something along the lines of, it's not like math because it's not clear when I have the right answer and when I have the wrong answer. And it's because of this mythos of there's no right answers in English. When we give our students negative feedback, hey, that's not right, uh, on a response that they give, uh, we need to give them the framework for figuring out why their answer was wrong. In math class, I always knew to go back to the textbook or to ask my friend or to ask the teacher if I got a math problem wrong, how to do it right. But we don't get that same framework for students who are told that their answer is wrong in the English class, right? Because in the first place, we're not even acknowledging that wrong answers exist, but they clearly do because you can get an F in your English class, right? So how did this come to be in the first place? I have a theory about it, twofold. One is that it's just kind of a popular truism that for whatever reason people haven't sat down to think about whether or not it is in fact actually true. True, um, true, I said that weird, two, uh, most English teachers become English teachers because they're naturally good at literary criticism. They're naturally good at interpreting stories. They were good at it in high school and they continue to be good at it in college. They got a PhD or a teaching credential and now here they are in your classroom wondering why you're not naturally good at it as well. And so in the process of them doing well in all of their English classes, this assumption was never challenged because they were never, probably not told very often that they got the wrong answer. Um, or if they did, then they kind of intuited the right answer without really thinking about why they knew what they knew and how they knew to correct themselves. But if you think about it, nothing could be more disheartening to a student who's trying to do well and who has been told that there are no wrong answers in class, but they are still the ones to get the wrong answer, right? How, how frustrating, how disheartening. Might as well give up because it's not like math. At least in math, I know why I got what I got wrong. 
So, I'm here to be a beacon of hope and of light and of goodness, I just love my book. Uh, to you, for those of you who are frustrated in your English class, there are wrong answers, just like in math. You're welcome. Um, but unlike math, there can also be multiple right answers, and that's really where the difference lies. Not in the fact that you can't get a wrong answer, you totally can, it's just that more than one answer can be right as the, at the same time as another right answer. Math problem, if the answer's four, the answer's not five, or any other number on the number. From negative infinity to positive infinity. In English, there is such a thing as multiple right answers. Um, I'd really like to advocate for English in this way because I think that's part of what makes English so fun, um, is this multiplicity of answers of people reading the book and coming in, coming up with ideas different than my own and me going, oh, I didn't see that, I didn't notice that, that's really cool. Um, and it also makes talking about books fun because once you kind of get the answers for what else is there to say, there's nothing else to say, we all agree that it's for. You don't have that, okay, you do have that close. They're not as fun as book clubs. So, figuring it out. Um, so the next natural question is, well, how do I arrive at at least one of these correct answers and avoid the wrong ones? My answer will always be this, and it always has been this. Always go back to the text. So, if you think about it, you know, if English is a an academic subject that can have people with PhDs and peer-reviewed articles that are published, and some are published and some are not, then there has to be a method by which we're determining these, these answers. And for us, our primary evidence is always the text itself. Just like in a science experiment, your primary evidence is the result of that science experiment. Um, and secondary evidence is other people with PhDs who have published said peer-reviewed articles in academic journals that are talking about and interpreting the results of the experiment, i.e. the book, um, and have proposed their own theories of explanation. So, this is where we're getting, this is the seatbelt. This is seatbelt time because this is where we're gonna get into it, big time. Okay. So some examples of right answers to help you kind of frame this differentiation. I'm going to use the scarlet letter as an example for the rest of this book, or the rest of this, this video. This is not a book. We're on camera, Alexandra. This, not everything is a book. Uh, this is a video. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to use the scarlet letter as an example. One, because it's a really popular text for most high school students. If you have graduated from an American high school, you've probably read it. Um, and you probably had to write papers on it. And you probably sort of face this conundrum with this text. Uh, so hopefully it won't be horrible and spoilery. Too bad the book was published a long time ago. Get with the times, yo. Um, and second of all, maybe it'll be useful because you are in fact writing this book and I can explain a little bit about it. All right, so probably the most popular question on this book, which is extremely popular and well wide read in class, is what does the letter A mean? What does it stand for? What does it symbolize? English classes everywhere resound with this question. So let's take a look at some right answers to this question and also some wrong answers to this question and how we differentiate between the two of them. Starting off with the correct answers. So the A stands for adulterous. Yes. Wow, much wow, such impress. Um, okay, but how do we know this? Uh, because they're Puritans, because uh, Hester committed adultery, uh, this is their punishment, their way of publicly shaming her for being an adulteress, and therefore the A stands for adultery. Wow, good job. Okay, so I feel like it's pretty obvious that this is a correct answer. Why? Because it's what the book says. And again, we're going back to the book for the core of our evidence for our interpretation. Um, what you might not find is a lot of secondary resources about it because it's extremely boring to write about it because it's patently true because the book just states it, right? So the A stands for adulteress. Uh, nobody, nobody's there going to be analyzing that, right? This kind of, to refer back to my previous video in this series, this, the answer to this question, using A as adulteress, this exists on the what level. You're basically just identifying a very important plot point that is obviously and patently true that the A stands for adulteress. Is there any questions on that one? Anybody? There's no, there's no reason to doubt that.
Okay, so the second correct answer that you can have for the text is that A stands for angel. Now again, this is something that we can return to the text to and find a foundation for the answer for it. Um, and it says it right in the text. Um, it's briefly mentioned in the prologue. It's the custom house. It's this introductory section in the book um, that sort of lays the groundwork for the narrator's voice. And um, I don't know if you remember, but he finds the letter A in the attic along with some papers. Um, and he's just there to tell us what the narrative is that he found in the attic. It's this collection of papers and reports about who this woman, Hester Prynne, is. Um, and it says that this old woman was so loved in the community that the uh, people thought that the A that she wore every day um, represented Angel. She's such a pillar of this community. So this one is a bit more interesting. In this case, we're investigating, well, how did she get from A, meaning adulteress, how did she transform that meaning with her very own life? What is that journey from getting from uh, the adulteress to Angel, you know, from point A to other point A? Um, and how does she transform the meaning over time? And that's really what the whole story is there to explain. So that's the teaser of the prologue. And this, if this were like a TV show, it'd be like, next time, you know, whatever, like narration, be like, how Hester transforms what was meant to shame her into something that honors her. Um, yeah, so A, meaning angel, again, founded on the, what the text itself says. So we have two right answers that are straight from the text. Um, and in this case, the book tells us that it means adulteress, the book tells us that it means angel, and the whole point of the narrative is to make a coherent answer for how it, it transformed in meaning. Um, and so uh, these two answers are easily reconciled within the context of the text, which is how we can have multiple correct answers. Um, but it begs the question, can there be right answers that are not directly stated in the Text. There's still evidence for it from the text, but it's not like the book is saying A stands for angel or A stands for adulteress in the same way. Um, and again, the answer to this question is yes. And this is where your literature classes start challenging your reasoning skills. Instead of using the linear logic of reading what the book tells you, understanding it and repeating it back to the teacher, um, as with the adulteress and angel, we will begin to use some like abstract reasoning skills to be able to delve into some of these more complex or extrapolated type answers. Um, and you kind of have to put multiple concepts together to make it happen. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap it there with those two correct answers. Come back to the next episode for the third correct answer and how I think it fits in with the text as a whole, how we can uh, explore the way our reasoning skills are challenged, um, how we bring in outside information to help support our theories and ideas. Um, and I think, man, I'm pumped about this one, so I, I think you guys should be excited too. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.